Yes, guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. It's Wednesday morning. Bugsy Malone is over here. She's noisy today. She's barking a lot. So I'm going to probably predict there's going to be some irritations on the background noise. But a lot of you come here to see Bugsy anyway. So maybe, maybe that's more your thing. Guys, this is your Wednesday morning transfer news, views and clues update. I hope you are going to enjoy it. Please do me a favor. Smash the like button for me on the video if you don't mind, if you enjoy the content. Your like game has been incredible. I think the last 10 videos I've done have had well over a thousand likes, which is just madness. So consistent support, and I really, really appreciate it. If we can get to that target again today, I'd absolutely be over the moon. Hit the subscribe if you haven't already. We passed 25K. I will put out a 25K sort of video thanking everybody personally at some point who's been a part of that journey. Um, but yeah, look, last night I got another 100, I woke up this morning to another 120 subscribers um, that all started flocking in around 10 o'clock. I don't know what happened at 10 p.m. I mean, I guess there must have been a stream that was going on for four hours that was supposed to be about Timo Werner, but 75% of the content was about yours truly. Do you know what? It's a beautiful thing in this cost of living crisis to be able to live rent free in people's heads is a, uh, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's a uh, very much appreciated thing. Thank you for all the attention that your toxicity brings my way. Hit the notification bell and drop a comment. Let me know your thoughts on today's topics. Right, we've got, I mean, where do we start? Forward line, Timo Werner, best place to start. The, the fans went into meltdown, some of them did. I saw some people saying, so that's it. You know, that's our forward line starting next year. Timo Werner and Solomon and Richie and Johnson. We're a disgrace. Levy out. I'm Ange out. Blah, 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 blah. Usual ridiculous overreactions to a situation when the window hasn't even opened yet. And people are saying that it's a failed window because of Timo Werner. A guy whose goals and assists per minute on a per 90 basis last season was comparable and better than the Abbey the likes of Mohamed Kudos and the likes of Martinelli at Arsenal. Now, I'm not saying that he is a better player than those guys, but I'm saying the overreaction to a loan deal, which is all it is, is, to me, bonkers, providing, providing that he is not the final piece of the forward line uh, processes and strategy going forward this summer. And according to Fabrizio Romano, if you just hold held your powder dry for about an hour, those people that lost their minds at the first sign of the news, you would have been reassured by Fabrizio Romano that Tottenham are still very much looking to bring in wingers and strikers this summer. Brian Hill is expected to leave the club this summer, with Perisic having already left. Timo, Timo Werner was a, a, an option at the time, a six-month option. Obviously, he missed the final few games through injury. And look, he's not, a, he's not a brilliant player. He's not the world's best player for sure. But I don't think you're going to find too many better on a loan deal, which keeps your money, your budgets available to go into different directions. And again, I've said this a thousand times, that players like Richarlison and or Sonny, not that you ever want, it's definitely not Sonny, you don't want to lose him. But if you're trying to rebuild something spectacular for the future and budgets are limited at the, because of the absence of Champions League revenue for the last two years, and I know people will say, well, you know, that's what the Beyonce concerts are there for. You know what you would need to, to handle about 40 Beyonce concerts just to cover the Champions League initial payment and guaranteed income windfall. So the absence of Champions League is meaningful. It is. And, you know, those people that were wishing for Manchester City to beat us to stop Arsenal winning the league and in so doing destroyed our chances of Champions League are the same people that will now moan about the transfers that we get as a consequence of the budgets that we have as a consequence of not finishing in the Champions League football. But that's just my take on it. Anyway, people, I was talking about players leaving to try and support that narrative. So Brian Hill's one of them, but we know he's not going to get too much in the way of money coming in. He's been a, a disappointing flop, if you like, at Tottenham. Richarlison came out yesterday and said that he's not leaving either. It was fake news. The, the reports in Brazil were fake news. Now, I don't know. I haven't seen what he said in Brazil. I don't know. I'm, I'm at the risk of being speculative and presumptuous here. Uh, 
there might be a chance that maybe he said something to the tune of I'm not happy at Tottenham um, in the Portuguese media. He said those sorts of things before and they've been reported and got back this way. Maybe they've been mistranslated, lost in the translation, whatever. But he says that the noise is fake news and that he's not leaving Tottenham this summer. He's very happy at Tottenham this summer. And so with that regard, I know we spoke about this yesterday with uh, the Devil's Advocate show with Johnny and Dave. Always love that weekly show. Ch go and check it out if you haven't seen it. Dave's take is that he doesn't think that it was, you know, he's happy that Richie's staying and we need to add one new, one new striker. And I take the point that he makes that if you do sell Richarlison, then you're going to have to bring in a second striker anyway. And depending on the money that you would have got, if you could have got it from the Saudi Arabia, then maybe the argument is that you could have done better with the money. 50 million quid that you might have been able to get could possibly have been reinvested into a striker that's better than him, that would cost less than him, and then use the difference to add to the rest of the budget to go and get a second striker. But at the same time, you know, if you're going to lose Harry Kane, your, your biggest goal-scoring threat, and then you're also okay with the idea of selling a Sonny, who would be the second biggest goal-scoring threat, and Richarlison, the third biggest goal-scoring threat, then obviously you're taking away a lot of what you can expect from a player and there's a lot of risk in the unknowns of signing players that are coming in. For me, listen, Tottenham still need a striker and if we're not going to have the money from, from a Richarlison sale, which it looks like we're not, then you know, an Ivan Tony, I think, would be someone that is reasonable. Although someone messaged me yesterday who knows journalists and he said that the noise that's not really been spoken about is that loads of clubs have turned their attention off of uh, Ivan Tony because of his personality. So... We'll see how it goes. But as a player, I don't think it's questionable that he is a brilliant outlet, offers something different, incredibly strong. His first touch is one of his best parts of his game, can finish with two feet, very good in the air. And I think that despite all of the unknowns regarding his, the reasons why he was betting, is that, is that part of an addiction? If so, there's a risk of relapse, like what we saw with Sandro Tonali. If it's not to do with an addiction and it's more just around and arrogance that, you know, I know I'm not supposed to be doing this, but I do what I want, I don't care anyway, then obviously there's that, then that is counterintuitive to what the sort of mentality monsters that Ange wants. He wants people to buy in and be a part of a team ethos, and maybe this guy isn't a right fit. But in terms of as a player, for me, I know a lot of you disagree. I think a lot of you will reflect on the last six months when he came back from his, from his band and he hasn't really lived up to expectations. So uh, we will see what happens there. But anyway... Um, so Fab is saying there's more to come. So that's good, right? On that basis, if as long as we still bring in another winger that's top draw and a striker that can compete with Richie, then I'm more than, more than okay with Timo Werner coming in. Yes, he's expensive at 165 or whatever it is grand a week. And I think he also has bonuses that if they're met, it goes up to 200 grand a week. If the bonuses are met and that comes in the shape of goals, then I think it's worth it. The 165 grand a week, look, is he worth that as a player? No, he's not. But is that his fault? Just like Endon Bele's pay is not his fault, it's what the, the club paid for them. And if Tottenham want to take the player off of Leipzig and the loan fee is minimal to zero, I don't know what it is, but if it is minimal to zero in the, in, and we're taking on the full wage, then, like I say, it's a one-year obligation and... I think it makes more sense than it doesn't. To a lot of people, you won't agree, but I'm okay with it, providing that we still do business at the top end. And according to Fab, it looks like we will. Let's move on to other news that's coming out. So uh, Nottingham Forest, Murillo, the left-sided, left-footed centre-back, has been linked with Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, he's valued at £35 million, according to Transfer Market. Brazilian international, young, Incredibly strong, incredibly tough, incredibly um, uh, agile and fast. He's got a very clever footballing IQ, knows how to position himself very well. I'm a big, big fan of Murillo. I think a lot of teams are. I'm not sure if the price tag will put players off, but put teams off because does he come into, you know, is he going to get into a top four team if 35 million or 40 million was the required fee? Is he going to get into a top four team to, as a starting number? three or four, however you want to think of it, I would say maybe, maybe not. Look, I'm not in any way casting shade on his, his talent because he looks like a potential beast in the future. His ability to carry the ball out, typical Brazilian flair from the back, is exactly what, what uh, Ange Postacoglu will look for. 
he's popped up with a couple of assists. And if you check out the assists that he scored last year, the through balls that he passed to get them, to get them through were just absolutely, not just defense splitting, but midfield and defense splitting passes. The guy is a real talent as, as a passer. He's a very, very clever player. And like I say, he loves dribbling the ball out and breaking the line. And against the low block, against even the high press teams who press up the line, if you can do that with someone like him, it opens up the play for so many others. When you get the ball forward to a James Madison, he's going to have more space to operate. If you were to have a Danny Olmo in there as well, or an Eze or whoever, the amount of things that they can then do as a consequence of the other teams having to reorganize and reshape their, their, their system after the defender has broken the line, it's a beautiful thing to see. I, I worry a little bit about the price tag in terms of how much of the budget will it absorb, but there is, of course, the rumors that Nottingham Forest are still in FFP trouble. And so, you know, they just about survived from relegation this year, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to have to think carefully about liquidating assets. With regards to that, we heard yesterday that Callum Hudson Adoy, I mean, I went into a Nottingham Forest stream, guys, and uh, just to find out what the vibe was about with Callum Hudson Adoy. And these people were all saying to me, which I wasn't aware of, that Chelsea have got a massive sell on fee, somewhere between 25 and 50%. Bugsy, shut up! 25 to 50% of the sell on fee from, uh, from Forest, if he was to go, would be going back to Chelsea. And so, you know, it always leads you down this path of do you want to help Chelsea out of a hole? If you do, then it has to be for a player that's perfect for your system. Now, Conor Gallagher is obviously a name that's very much hot on everybody's lips. Very much all of the main, the main journalists, the, the respectable journalists, if you like, are saying that this is the priority for the summer and might happen in the next week or two because of the Euros coming up. And I'd be OK with that one. I go back and forth on the Conor Gallagher value proposition for Tottenham, but it's clearly someone that Ange wants and you have to back Ange. Just like with Timo Werner, if Ange has okayed this, and he's already said a thousand times that no one will come through his first team unless he approves it, he understands that there needs to be a little bit of give and take, but generally speaking, he knows what he wants. And it looks like Callum Hudson-Odoi is no longer the target. Johan Langer, low Lange, whatever, however you say his name, he apparently was part of the, the uh, community or the, um, the posse or whatever that were analysing this one and he poured cold water over it and just didn't, didn't rate the guy at that price point at 35 million quid. And I completely agree. I was saying before, I think Callum hudson Adoy is, is an interesting player. I do like the guy. But when you factor in that he's got Achille Hill ongoing issues, but if one of those things snaps again, he could be out for a long time. Before the injury, a brilliant player, but is that thing going to be a recurring thing? It's not quite as commonly recurring as an injury as something like a hamstring but it's, it does happen and the fact that you're helping Chelsea out and the fact that it's 35 million quid I just don't think he's, he ticks all the boxes at that price point at that level when you're baking all those variables so I'm glad to see that Langer is now saying no to that and we're going to look in other directions in terms of what the other directions are well they're speculative there really isn't any noise out around other wingers today that we are looking for but apart from Fabrizio Romano who's saying that we are absolutely still in that hunt but he hasn't dropped any names and we can just go I could just speculate with you and go through the names that have been linked in the past but I'm going to save you the bother uh, Murillo though like I say really interesting player I just worry about the price tag but in terms of do I like him do I think he's brilliant does he, does he fit the balance uh, of the squad with the left footed left sided um, uh, option does he have the ability to draw run the ball out absolutely and I'd even make the argument that with his ball playing skills, if necessary, just like a Mickey van der Ven, he could drift out into the left-hand side and then play as a left-back who gets forward but ultimately cuts in and becomes part of a triple pivot six or whatever you want to call it in this inverted fullback system. Speaking of left-backs that have been linked with us, Sky Sports were reporting all day yesterday that... Sorry, I forgot to mention about Murillo, just to give you a couple more reasons why I think he's absolutely brilliant. Um, he, his adaptability and his versatility in tactical setups has been proven in his young years. He's very, he's very open-minded, hardworking, listens to the coach and will do what's asked of him. And for Angie's system specifically, that is a reason why I think I'd love to see it as long as the price wasn't prohibitive and didn't screw up our, our process. Defensively, still very good. The stats, I'll put the, I've always put the stats up. You, you'll have already seen the stats, but in terms of um, what we're looking for in defensively. The stats don't look brilliant as a defensive entity, apart from in clearances. 
He's up there, I think, in the 95th percentile or something like that from memory. He's also made zero errors, which shows that he's, he's an intelligent player and doesn't get himself caught out in too many difficult situations. Big fan of Murillo, and I don't mind it at all if it happens. Uh, Doherty, the Luton left back, is the link that's, that uh, Sky Sports were talking about. This guy, I've seen people, again, uh, last night talking absolute guff about this guy. Clearly, they don't watch enough football. Doherty is uh, a, one of the best left backs in the Premier League last season. Absolutely phenomenal season from the guy. His stats will show you he's a brilliant passer of the ball, long, medium, short. And the team that got relegated, remember, his performance was sensational. Two goals, eight assists from the left back. He's one of the best crossers with the left foot in the game. In terms of his uh, shot creating actions, his free kicks, his direct set pieces, just up there and gives you another element that you don't necessarily think of when you're talking about from a left back position. Tackles in the final third. So when he does get forward, which is often, his ability to win the ball back is up there again in the 95th or so percentile. For me, I think he uh, is incredibly gifted in a lot of the areas that Tottenham would look for. But unfortunately, when you look at his heat map, and if you just watch Luton generally, you'll know that he's not an inverted fullback type of player. That's the problem for me. He, gets, he stays very much wide, as wide as possible. And he's very good at crossing the ball in, very good at offering Luton the outlet. And Luton, like I say, I'm disappointed Luton went down last year because I thought there were teams that were, that were worse than them overall. And I thought Luton put in a great shift in many, many games, trying to fight back against teams that are much bigger and better than them. And often did so and played with their own kind of very unique style, but just didn't have enough on the, in the sort of moments to get the points on the day. He plays a left back. He's also been a left midfielder and a right midfielder. So he's got a lot of versatility if we were to do it. Um, the, and he loves to carry the ball out, loves to bring the ball out. So dribbles, uh, carries into the final third. All of these things carries into the penalty. Area. You'll see the stats on the screen. They are all right up there. So there's loads of reasons where you could think that that's adaptable to what we're trying to do with our inverted fullbacks. And again, it's a, this is a rotation competition for, for Udogi. I've said a thousand times, I do think Udogi has a frame, a natural frame on him that reminds me of Reese James. We've seen him go down with a couple of injuries. He's now having a, a surgery or he's had a surgery on his quad. And you just worry a little bit about the kind of the rigorous responsibilities and requirements of playing in that left back system for Tottenham. Is he someone that's going to be an ever-present injury threat or an injury risk. I believe he is. So making sure that we have someone that can come in that is, um, that is a good fit is, and not that much of a drop-off is super important for me. And when you hear that Emerson Royale might be leaving to go to Milan or to Bayern Munich, if we can get good money back for Emerson Royale, I wouldn't mind seeing Doherty come in uh, to Tottenham. I, do, I really do think he's adaptable as well. However, like I say, the main issue, the only problem I have with Doherty's as a viable candidate is that where he has been at his best has been out wide getting to the byline. Similar to players like Anthony Robinson, to a degree, Rico Henry, all these players that I really are uh, massive fans of at, uh, at sort of mid-table or lower-table teams in the Premier League that I think would also be Really good fits. Uh, eight Nuri at Wolves. Eight Nuri, I think, has got more, more of the ability to drift in and play in that kind of, um, like I say, triple pivot six, or however you want to think of it, the kind of inverted fullback that gets forward. But the consistent thing with me with Robinson and players like Doherty, very, very good at getting deep, getting to the byline. Haven't seen them coming in too frequently. If you look at the heat map of Doherty, you'll see that it supports the narrative, he's a guy that sticks to the byline. Is that gonna be too much of a risk if it's true? He's only valued at 10 million pound according to transfer market. I think he's valued more than that in reality. But with Luton going down, then, you know, he's probably proven himself to be too good and won't wanna go down to Luton unless he wants to go down with the ship and then hope to come back up again this year. We will find out, guys. We will find out. So Richie's not leaving. Uh, what have we done here? Emerson Royale. Yeah, the other story, of course, is Emerson Royale looking like he might be going to, to, um, to Italy or to Germany. And I'd support it. That's, I don't mind Emerson Royale. I think that Tottenham need, at the moment, I was having this conversation yesterday a lot, that there's a concern that, you know, if we were to sell Emerson Royale, we were to sell Regulon, Cessnion's probably going to be leaving the club. And, and so 
in that scenario, if all that stuff happens reasonably soon or early in the window, then we would be technically with just Pedro Porro and um, Emma, uh, and, uh, and Destiny Doggy and Ben Davies. That would be kind of it. But like I say, guys, the window hasn't even officially opened yet. It's the 29th of May. It's not the 29th of, Sept of August or September. We need to uh, kind of relax a little bit. At some point, you have to buy before you sell or you sell before you buy. One of the things has to happen. And it's easier to negotiate from a financial position of strength if you don't have to sell after the player you bought. So if you can expedite the, the Emerson transfer and get it done early, then I think the leverage then is in the hands of Daniel Levy because he can say, look, we need a player, but at the same time, there's loads of time on our hands here and we've got the ability to, to be able to pay and utilize our FFP leverage before the June 30th deadline. So to me, I'm all good with it. I don't know if the Emerson deal is, is advanced or if it's even real or just journalist talk, but it will be fascinating to see. Joe Roden, the last story I haven't talked to you about today, that looks like it's going to happen, even if it's not Leeds who can afford him. Apparently, his performances in the championship last season have alerted loads of Premier League clubs. Maybe one of the clubs that will come up, maybe one of the clubs that might lose a talented player like a Jared Branthwaite, potentially. He might be sold this summer from Everton, and they might look to someone like Joe Roden and think that's not a bad replacement because Joe Roden has got, still got a lot of time on his hands and proven himself to be decent level for that sort of standard of the championship. And as I say, could come up. So things are looking interesting in the world of Tottenham Hotspur, guys. Things are starting to move and the window hasn't even officially opened. Timo Werner, the big news. Like I say, I personally am more than okay with him coming in and participating. I'd love it if he could take a little bit of time this summer to try and work on his finishing, specifically get a finishing coach that can just help him with his confidence under pressure. Maybe even talking with a therapist about that if he acknowledges that it is confidence that is the reason why he, uh, he can't finish. I think he got five big chances missed last season. A lot of people think he's you know, someone who, who's uh, consistently the top end of the big chances missed league. I looked into it. Do you remember a couple of days ago, I said I'm pretty sure that, that, that uh, Ollie Watkins has made more misses than anybody else? That might have been the case a few weeks before the end of the window when the last time I checked. But as I looked yesterday, actually, Erling Haaland is up there with the biggest... He's the number one, I think, at 32 big chances missed. You know, obviously he still bangs in the goals, but he can miss a few goals. Ollie Watkins banging in the goals, but still misses the goals. At Tottenham Hotspur, the biggest big chance missed player was Brennan Johnson. And after that, I think it was Hyung Min Sun at seven. And there was somebody else at seven as well who named, whose name, oh, Christian Romero missed seven, believe it or not. Big chances last year. And Timo Werner missed five. So, you know, the, the idea that he is um, constantly fluffing his lines, I don't think is necessarily true. But for sure, there is truth that he needs to be better uh, with his confidence and his finishing. In terms of, I'll throw up a little, uh, little uh, graphic for you so you can look at it. In terms of uh, his X assists per, per minutes played on a per 90 basis. And this was a graphic that was trying to support the notion of Cole Palmer being an outperformer. And he is. Cole Palmer's obviously fantastic. But if you look... Uh, Timo Werner is in a very healthy spot, right at the very top end of the X, Y axis, which is where you need to be for that particular measurement, which shows that Timo Werner does have the ability to create chances. If we can just find a way to keep him calm and measured in the final decision, rather than crossing the ball at 100 miles an hour, hammering it as hard as he can, which, I, which frustrates the life out of me. And obviously, when he gets in the chance to, you know, gets close proximity to the goal, um, to try and put it in the back of the net rather than elsewhere, and I think you've got a player there that makes sense, as I say, as long as it's not the only bit of business. And Fabrizio Romano has reassured everybody that Tottenham are still very much looking for strikers and wingers. And hopefully those names are going to be top end of the market. So from a budgetary perspective, I think it makes sense from a, you can't do everything all at the same time. You can't have 50 million pound players, 60 million pound players in the five or six areas that we need help in this summer, unless you sell everybody for top money. And when was the last time Tottenham managed to do that? As I always keep telling you guys, the, the tier of player that we have is not, looking, is not looking to be bought for by the teams of the tier above that have the money in Europe. And so you're fishing in a different pond and it's not easy. Look at Piero Mojoibier. The Juventus still looks like it's dead. If Atletico Madrid don't have any money and Piero Mojoibier still thinks that he's only going to leave Tottenham for a club that fits his ambition, you're filtering out a lot of teams who 
are in the, in the pool of teams that he would feel acceptable to move to, that happen to need a midfielder, that happen to uh, have the money to pay, and also that happen to value Pierre or Hoybier. So it's not easy. There's always three parties that need to be ready for a transfer, the buying club, the selling club, and the player. Richarlison's saying he's not leaving, so it doesn't matter what Tottenham want to do. Even if Tottenham had a £70 million bid come in from Saudi Arabia, if this guy wants to get back into the Brazil team, we've seen with Jordan Henderson going to Saudi Arabia has cost him his place in the England team. I agree with that decision. And if he wants to go to Brazil for the World Cup in a couple of years' time, then he's going to need to be playing top-tier football. So, you know, I don't expect Richarlison to leave now. And on that basis, if he's going to stay, I'll get behind him. You know how I feel about him, but I still want him to do well for Tottenham because I'm a Tottenham fan first. And as long as Tottenham go and get a top-tier striker to compete with him, then I'm cool with it. And as long as Tottenham go out, and if we sell, sell Brian Hill, and maybe even Manuel Solomon, depending on his injury situation, then as long as we go and replace him as well with a top, cent a top winger, like I say, a Rafinha, a Pedro Neto, injury issues aside, a Nico Williams, whoever. The, the list is a never-ending one. And we'll do a video about that at some point. But that's it for your transfer news, views, and clues. Jesus, 26 minutes. I'm sorry it's been a long one. But you know what? It is what it is. Like, subscribe, and comment, guys. I really appreciate all the support. And I really appreciate all the tension that is coming my way from people who don't support me. You lot, stay toxic. The rest of you, stay awesome. Love you, like you. And I'll see you on the video tomorrow.